Hi friends, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. Today's episode is about Brittany Murphy. Brittany Murphy was a vibrant young actress who was so full of life. She was seemingly healthy, so when she died at 32 years old of pneumonia, the whole world was shocked. And to this day, Brittany's fans and even those closest to her are still suspicious, and people have taken to sharing conspiracy theories of what could have happened to Brittany. There are quite a few theories out there, and I'm going to touch on all of them, but more importantly, we're going to break down the theories and review the physical evidence to find out what really killed Brittany Murphy. Brittany Murphy was known for her roles in Clueless, 8 Mile, Just Married, Uptown Girls, Little Black Book. She also did some voice acting. She was in Happy Feet, and she played Luann in King of the Hill. You might even remember her as a child star. She had roles in TV shows like Sister Sister, Party of Five. She was in Boy Meets World, which is one of my favorite roles of hers. She played Trini, who was this really quirky, goofy girl, and she was Topanga's best friend. She was really funny, like a true entertainer from the very beginning. And she always knew that she was going to be some kind of performer. Brittany was born in Atlanta, Georgia on November 10th, 1977. Her parents are named Sharon Murphy and Angelo Bertolotti. Angelo was an Italian New Yorker who was involved in organized crime. Sharon was 14 years old when she met him. She was actually friends with one of his sons. Ten years later, Sharon looked Angelo up, and they got together, and Brittany was born. Sharon and Angelo split up when Brittany was only two years old, and from then on, Angelo was mostly out of the picture, and Sharon raised Brittany pretty much single-handedly. Brittany and Sharon were crazy close throughout Brittany's life. I mean, crazy close. They referred to each other as soulmates. They did everything together. Even well into Brittany's adulthood, people said that they had more of a best friend relationship than a mother-daughter relationship. When Brittany would get invited to parties and stuff, she would sometimes ask if she could bring Sharon along. As I said before, Brittany always knew that she would be an entertainer. When she was about six years old, she and her father were eating at a restaurant and they saw Burt Reynolds at the next table. They were actually filming there and she went over to talk to them. When they brought her back, she said, one day you're going to ask for my autograph. Sharon and Brittany lived in New Jersey for a while, and Brittany started going to performing arts school, and she started training in singing, dancing, and acting at only four years old. As a young girl, she did some commercials, and when she was 13, she landed a role in Drexel's class and asked her mom if they could move to L.A. to pursue her acting career. Well, actually, she begged her, and Sharon obliged. So Brittany went to L.A. at just 13 years old, and she actually stayed with the chaperone for the first couple of months, until Sharon could sell all their shit to move out there with her. Here, Brittany had to learn how to cook and take care of herself for the time being. But when Sharon got to L.A., she did everything for Brittany. She was, like, more than a manager. Brittany openly admitted that she never bothered to learn how to drive or balance her checkbook. She was happy to let other people do it for her, like her mom, her business partners, and eventually her husband, Simon. In 1994, Brittany got her breakthrough role playing Ty Frazier in Clueless. She was still a minor, so Sharon had to accompany her on set during the filming. During this time, Sharon was diagnosed with breast cancer. Brittany spent five weeks completely at her mother's side taking care of her. She did all this while trying to do her best work on Clueless. Sadly, Brittany didn't have any space to express her emotions about this. She had to cope with this tragic news all while holding down her job on Clueless and dealing with being a teenager. Unfortunately, this kind of thing happens a lot with child actors. They are thrust into the limelight before even hitting puberty, and they have to juggle schoolwork with press appearances and film schedules, all before they've even had their first kiss. Also, studies have shown that child performers can often find themselves struggling with reality and succumbing to the ambitions of those around them and finding themselves performing not just to please their parents, but to please everyone around them. And they can quickly forget that their career doesn't define them. I was listening to Jeanette McCurdy's podcast. Jeanette McCurdy is the actress on Nickelodeon who played Sam in iCarly and Sam and Cat. 
Her podcast is called Empty Inside, and she's spoken out about her experience as a child actor a lot. One of the things she said was that when she started going to therapy, she found herself trying to be funny and entertaining to her therapist. And when she realized it, she was like, oh my god, what? I'm not supposed to be entertaining them. I'm going to talk more about child stars in a future episode, but I highly recommend you listen to Empty Inside also. Sharon would get cancer a second time in 2003, and as you can imagine, Brittany took care of her again. After Clueless, jobs started coming in for Brittany. She got a lot of supporting character roles. It was a while before she would play the main character in a film. But Brittany really was a favorite for supporting actors. Like in Girl Interrupted alongside Angelina Jolie and Winona Ryder, and then again in 8 Mile with Eminem. Throughout her career, Brittany's love life was pretty publicized. She dated Eminem for a bit during 8 Mile, and then she dated Ashton Kutcher for a bit following Just Mary. She was also engaged to a production assistant from Little Black Book, but the engagement lasted less than a year. Ashton Kutcher had once said about Britney that she was very needy and too full-on. He apparently went on to say that she wanted to be married and live like a princess in a fairy tale, and she was so desperate she would do anything to get married no matter what it was. Now, I'm not telling you this to bash Britney. Um, I'm just telling you this because it kind of comes into play later with her husband, Simon. So let's talk about Simon for a second. In late 2006, Britney met Simon Monjack, and they were married in May 2007. Simon Monjack is a screenwriter and photographer and makeup artist, so he says. He's really nowhere near celebrity status as Brittany Murphy, so when they got together, people were just shocked. If you missed all the tabloid drama during their relationship, let me tell you, everybody was talking about this. Brittany was hot, and I mean that both appearance-wise as well as how her career was booming. She was like America's sweetheart at that time, and all of a sudden she was dating this big fat guy who everybody seemed to hate. How that relationship started is kind of murky. Simon claims that he actually met Brittany when she was a teenager, but there's no evidence of them actually having met before 2006. Within three months, they were married in a super private ceremony. Not even their parents were invited, except probably Sharon, because she was literally always there. So let me tell you a little bit about why people hate Simon. Simon was an extremely shady dude. He had a nickname that was, like, widely used. Everybody called him Conjack. A lot of people, like investors, filmmakers, even, like, friends and family of his, have accused Simon of some pretty shady shit. He had a girlfriend from whom he borrowed 200,000 pounds, and he never paid her back. Then there, Susan Stewart Potter, they were supposed to make a movie together called The White Hotel, and he destroyed her without a second thought. Basically, he partnered with her on this movie, and then he took her name off of it. In 2005, warrants were issued for his arrest on credit card fraud charges. In 2006, he was sued by a mortgage firm in New York and was forced to fork over $470,000. Simon also had an ex-wife, Simone, who had invested a lot of money, and he never paid her back. So she sued him and was awarded $63,000 in the divorce. He didn't actually pay her until about 2009. Between 1997 and 2006, Monjack was evicted from four separate homes. The reason I bring that up is because this guy claimed to be a billionaire, but he clearly was just like borrowing money from people all over the place and not paying it back. And somehow he always ended up at rock bottom again, just leeching off of other people. Then there was the movie Factory Girl. He claimed that he worked on that film, but the director, George Hickenlooper, insists that Simon had nothing to do with it, and Simon was just attaching his name to it. George actually warned Brittany about Simon at one point. He asked her if she knew what she was doing, if she knew who she was marrying, She got angry and said that she knew him better than anybody else and hung the phone up on him. A few months later, George tried to call her to see if everything was all right. Simon picked up the phone and wouldn't let him talk to her. Simon also had a daughter named Jasmine who was born in 2002, 
but he apparently lacked the parenting instincts and pretty much left Jasmine and her mom behind. In 2003, when Jasmine was 18, she told a journalist that the last time she saw her father was when she was seven. When she did see him, she saw his money, but when he left, there was nothing. He never paid child support or left Jasmine or her mother anything after he died. Also, and this is just to show you what a greaseballed yucko this guy is, he was, like, notorious for going out to dinner with important filmmaking people and bragging about being a millionaire, or, I'm sorry, a billionaire, and about the success of all his projects, and he literally never picked up the tab. He always left it for other people to pick up. People would make jokes about how he'd be like, oh, I'm this big billionaire, and then they'd be like, well, I just paid for his cheap falafel, though. There's this one source who worked with Simon who had said, Simon invited me to lunch at the Bel Air Hotel with him and his girlfriend. He kept up all his old pretenses. He paid the check, billing it to his room. I found out later that his poor girlfriend paid for their stay at the Bel Air. And there's a lot of stories about Simon like this. Like, he would have a girlfriend or a wife and just completely leech onto them, take, ev take them for everything they were worth. Which probably explains how his ex-wife was able to sue him for $63,000. So, Simon and Brittany got married in 2007. But before that, in February 2007, Simon was arrested because his visa had expired. Remember, Simon's British. So, when they arrested him, he apparently bawled like a blubbering baby and was detained for nine days before Brittany was able to bail him out. When Brittany and Simon got married just a few weeks later, People started to speculate that this rushed marriage was a fraudulent attempt to keep Simon from getting deported, and the Department of Homeland Security and ICE started to keep a close eye on them. That's not a theory. They really did start to keep an eye on them to make sure that their marriage was legitimate. Around the same time, Brittany told her staff that she was unable to pay some of their salary. She told an elaborate story of how she was being stalked by a high-powered Hollywood player and that Simon was kidnapped, and she had to pay a ransom to get him back. Oddly, the dates of the alleged kidnapping seemed to coincide with the dates that Simon was detained for his expired visa. So there is one thing that could explain why she told this bizarre story, but it's weird. In June 2007, some guy named Arturo Globenfeld posted on Simon's IMDb page saying that Simon owed him $16 million for an investment that he never paid back. News outlets started spewing about Simon's many enemies, including this investor to whom he owes millions of dollars. Funny thing is, Arturo turned out to be a guy named Rob, who's just a big old troll. Rob admitted after Brittany's death that he was just getting a kick of adding to the narrative that Simon's a sketchy piece of shit while creating this fictional character who had big money. When Brittany died, he decided it wasn't fun anymore, and he was a little bit ashamed, so he dropped it. Interestingly, though, Simon obviously must have known that he didn't owe $16 million to any Arturo Globenfeld, and yet he never tried to clear that up with the media. I wonder if maybe Brittany decided to roll with this Arturo story and use it as the foundation for her little story about Simon getting kidnapped. Maybe she just couldn't pay her staff at that time, or maybe she just didn't want people to know what really happened with Simon and Ice. Anyway, I searched far and wide about this kidnapping, but I don't think it really happened, and I don't think anybody really knows why Brittany made that story up. So, throughout Brittany and Simon's relationship, Brittany's friends really didn't like Simon, and they didn't like who Brittany was becoming while she was with him. It seemed like, once again, he was just leeching onto a woman with money, and maybe Brittany was a little bit vulnerable. Again, she always wanted to have a family and children of her own. That was her dream. And Brittany's career also started to suffer while she was with Simon. So, let's jump forward to November 2009. At this point, Sharon, Brittany, and Simon are all living together. Apparently, Brittany and Sharon always lived together, and it was always the plan for them to continue living together. So the three of them went to Puerto Rico to film the movie The Caller, but Brittany was fired after the first day. 
Apparently, Simon kept showing up to the set drunk and disrupting the production process. He was hovering over people, just wouldn't get out of the way. So he was banned from the set. Most accounts say that Britney was fired from the show for this reason. But Simon and Britney said that it was their choice, citing creative differences or something like that. At the end of the day, the movie's producer said that it was a mutual decision. So anyway, Brittany was no longer working on the film, but they decided to stay in Puerto Rico for a while, and Simon and Sherrod contracted a staph infection. In fact, on the flight back, Simon actually had a mild heart attack. Then, Brittany caught the bacteria. I read in one source that she was also dealing with a severe case of laryngitis and anemia, but I don't know how that's known for sure because she decided not to go to the doctor, thinking she could overcome it on her own. When she finally made the doctor's appointment, it was too late and she didn't make it. So Brittany worked on a few films right before she died. Uh, one was The Caller, like I said, that didn't really work out. Then she worked on Abandoned and Across the Hall. Even at this point, Brittany's castmate said that she was such a joy to work with. But her personality would change completely when Simon came around. She appeared to not function around him. The actor Jay Pickett, who worked closely with Britney in the movie Abandoned, said, I do know that Britney's demeanor would change a little when he was around. We could be having a conversation and she would see him coming and just change. And he wasn't the only person to make a comment like that. A crew member from The Caller also said she was one of the team when he wasn't there. She would be giggling and really having a laugh and was really touchy-feely, and he would arrive like he owned the set and she would automatically revert to his shadow. Another thing is, the shooting schedule for the movie Abandoned was so tight, it was vital for the cast and crew to eat and drink water frequently. Only, nobody ever saw Brittany eat anything. What they did see was Simon constantly bringing her Starbucks and vitamins, and that's the only thing anyone ever saw Brittany consume on set. While Brittany was filming Abandoned, she supposedly started to question her future with Simon, and she turned to Jay Pickett for advice. And he felt that Simon clearly had an emotional hold over her. Brittany had mentioned to him that some of her friends didn't like Simon, and they were telling her that she should get out of the relationship. In Abandoned, Jay's character rescues Brittany's character. Jay recalls that while filming that final scene, Brittany asked the producers if they could rewrite the ending so Brittany's character could end up with Jay's character. The producers said no, but Jay felt that it was maybe a little telling about her state of mind. She was looking for someone to rescue her. Another thing, while Brittany was working in Abandoned, her appearance was really declining. Aside from the fact that she was losing a lot of weight, she often looked sickly. Cast and crew members have said that her hands often looked a bluish-purple color, and her makeup was just terrible. Apparently, Simon started doing Britney's hair and makeup for her, and if you watch Abandoned, you can see it. Her hair is super frail and damaged, like it was unkept. And her makeup, like, her lipstick is just really big. It's like a person who's never put on lipstick was trying to line her lips to look bigger than natural. I don't know how else to put it. I'll upload a, a photo on my website, but everybody agreed that her makeup looked terrible, but nobody said anything about it, presumably because nobody wanted to question Simon. But I mean, it was bad. Like, people even compared it to funeral home makeup. And her makeup and hair, along with her weight loss and the fact that she looked sickly, made people really, really worried about her. I will mention that at the time of Britney's death, she weighed approximately 115 pounds. Britney was 5 foot 2 and 32 years old, so she was underweight. But by Hollywood standards, it really wasn't considered too skinny. The last film Britney worked on was called Across the Hall. Her behavior started getting really weird here, and that's when people really started talking about her having a substance abuse problem that was getting out of control. According to her castmates, she would show up a whole three to four hours late with no apologies and no explanations, and she would apparently go to the bathroom a million times a day and take forever each time. She was also really, really thin, so people were kind of thinking she either was doing drugs or she had an eating disorder. 
Either way, something was going on with her, and everybody noticed it. Okay, now, December 19th, 2009. Linda Monjack, that's Simon's mom, she said that she spoke to Simon and Brittany on Skype, and Brittany mentioned that she had a chest infection and didn't feel well. Linda told her that she should see a doctor, and Brittany replied that she already made an appointment for that Monday the 21st. On Sunday the 20th, Brittany woke up at about 3 a.m. coughing and made her way to her bedroom balcony for air. Simon woke up to the sound of her coughing, and Brittany asked him to go get Sharon. So he called Sharon up, and when she got there, she found Brittany lying on the patio trying to catch her breath. Sharon said, Baby, get up. And Brittany said, Mommy, I can't catch my breath. Help me. According to Simon, she also said, I'm gonna die, Mommy. I love you. <sighs> Sharon said she was always so dramatic. Brittany had been asking to use Simon's oxygen machine, but he was like, no, that could stop your heart. Clearly, Brittany was reaching out for help, and they were not taking her seriously. According to Sharon, she then had a seizure. Sharon saw that her lips were parched like she was dehydrated, so she made her drink some tea with ginger and lemon. At around 7 a.m., Brittany made her way to the bathroom, which was like her safe space. Sharon went in after her a few minutes later, and Brittany said, Mommy, I really don't feel well. And she collapsed again around 8 a.m. I just have to say, this is a grown woman calling her mom, Mommy, and asking her for help. Obviously, something's wrong. So, Sharon screamed for Simon, and he tried to put Brittany in a cold shower while Sharon called for 911. Here's a little clip of that 911 call. Where to buy 197? What's the address of the emergency? 1895 Rising Glen Road. What's the phone number you're calling from? Street. Tell me exactly what happened. Oh, somebody's passed out. Somebody what? Oh, somebody's, my daughter's passed out. She's, she's, they're do, we're doing mouth to mouth. Please get oh, your phone. Oh, okay, please. okay. She's All right, right, we're going to. How old is your daughter? She's Isn't 30, it weird how she's 30. just like, someone collapsed? Like, as if it's just some stranger on the street? I don't know, man. I mean, I guess we all do things in shock, but I just found that super weird. Like, that's her baby. Detectives arrived to launch an investigation at 4 p.m., and Simon opened the house up with open arms. Oddly, Simon demanded that he did not want an autopsy performed on Brittany. He said it all creepy, too, saying that she had these perfect curves and pristine skin, and how can we cut her up? But they were like, nah, bro, we have to, and then they did the autopsy anyway. Brittany's death was officially ruled as accidental, concluding the cause of death to be pneumonia and anemia, exacerbated by a mixture of over-the-counter medications. Supposedly, Brittany suffered from a chronic iron deficiency from having heavy periods. After Brittany's death, Simon and Sharon were understandably broken. But their behavior was a little weird. Not a little. It was pretty fucking weird. I understand that people all grieve differently, but Sharon and Simon were really, really close. It seemed almost like Sharon had moved on from having a codependent relationship with Brittany to having a codependent relationship with Simon. Simon and Sharon did this photo shoot where they were, like, holding each other while posing with pictures of Brittany. Which, first off, I think it's weird that they did a photo shoot like that. But if you look at the photos, they look romantic. I'm sorry to say it, I just feel it's uncomfortable. Later on, it was reported that Sharon and Simon started sleeping in the same bed together after Brittany died. I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but first. While Simon and Sharon were planning Brittany's memorial service, they made plans to start the Brittany Murphy Foundation and kind of used the memorial service as like a launch party for the foundation. Simon started asking for donations of up to $1,000 for people to attend or $10,000 for corporations in order to raise money for the foundation. It was supposed to feature a bunch of entertainers. Eminem was said to be one of the ones invited. But the day before the event, it was announced that the memorial service would be canceled due to family illness and would be rescheduled. 
People were sketched out because Simon's well known as a pretty shady dude once again. And some of the staff who worked for the venue have stated that the venue was booked only a week in advance and seemed like there were no real preparations made for the event. By March 2010, Simon would not stop talking about Britney. He did not want the attention on her to die out. So he was pretty much dying to talk to any reporters who would listen to him, and it seemed like he was always trying to drum up something new so that she would be the subject of all the headlines again. So he, like, buddied up with Radar Online since they were, like, willing to listen to him for a bit after everybody else stopped. So on March 20th, Simon invited them to his house and gave them a tour, allegedly for $10,000. By the way, Simon was a disgusting mess during this tour. Literally, you can watch the video and he is unshaven, wearing sweatpants, looking all sweaty and shit. People reported him walking around in sweats that had urine stains on the front of them. And he looked sickly too. And from what we know now, maybe he was already, like, dying at this point. So he shows them around the house, specifically showing off Britney's clutter. He shows them these racks and racks of designer clothes that belong to Britney. And they're, like, taking over the house. And then you see Britney's bathroom, which is completely covered with products. And Simon explains that he has his own bathroom and he hasn't set foot in there since Britney died. Literally, nobody ever cleaned up Britney's bathroom after she died. Throughout the interview, Simon started to slur his words and sound kind of drunk. It was clear in the video that Simon was a fucking wreck. His mom, Linda, started getting really worried about him and she offered to fly out to be with him. But Simon kept telling her to just give him a few weeks to pull himself together a bit. So they kept talking on Skype, and Linda says that she could see him deteriorating before her eyes. So she kept offering to come out, and he kept telling her, give me a few more weeks. But Simon got increasingly worse. Over the next few months, he would start to fall into a deep, deep depression. He would rarely get out of bed, rarely shower. Simon finally agreed to meet up with his mom in New York on April 28th. Only Simon got sick, like really sick, and couldn't make it. He was complaining of numbness and tingling, and he was relying on his oxygen machine more than usual. He also had a fever and was coughing up thick black shit and clutching his chest a lot. On May 22, 2010, Simon spoke to Linda on the phone. She said that his speech was drawn out and slurred and barely comprehensible. And she's able to make out that he says he's sick and needs to go to the hospital. In the background of the phone call, she could hear Sharon saying, You should tell the doctor your temperature is 104. But he never got any medical attention. Linda says that she demanded to speak to Sharon and pleaded and pleaded with her to take him to the hospital. On May 23rd, Simon had been complaining of abdominal and lung pain, and he had fainted numerous times throughout the day but Sharon didn't get him any help. She later told paramedics that it wasn't like he was losing consciousness, but just like he was closing his eyes and becoming unresponsive. Come on, Sharon. So his symptoms were consistent with pneumonia. He had a fever and fatigue, and he was sweating and shaking. He had chest pains and shortness of breath. However, symptoms like stomach pain, nausea, numbness, and tingling and vomiting are also common to people who have been exposed to household pesticides. Sharon says that she slept in a chair across the room from him to keep an eye on him, but by this point everybody's already certain that they're sleeping in the same bed. According to Sharon, she woke up at 7.30pm on May 23rd to a gurgling noise coming from Simon. She said she saw a brown, foam-like liquid coming out of the side of his mouth. She was a little concerned, but not too much, so she just wiped his mouth and tried to unblock his airway as best as she could. And after about 45 minutes, when his condition hadn't changed, she decided to call for medical attention. Sharon's timeline is a little bit wonky, by the way. You'll see. So Sharon finally called 911. I'm going to play you a clip from the 911 call. It's like, Sharon's being kind of difficult. But unfortunately, I think the 911 operator was also maybe a little bit short with her. Anyway, listen for yourself. Alright, is that a house or an apartment? It's a house. 
Okay. Okay. Call the set of the Sunset Plaza. Please get okay. here quickly. Ma'am, what's, ma what's yes. the number you're calling me from? From the house. What's the phone number, please? I know. That's fine. Which is the correct number? They're, they're all the same number. I don't know what number I called you from because okay. there's lots of lines going into the house. All right, now please what is don't the... worry about that. Just get somebody out here. Ma'am. Ma'am. Yes. What's the problem? What happened? My son-in-law, he stopped breathing. All right. I am going to send help right while we're talking. Are you with him now? Yes. How old is he? He's 43, 42. 42-year-old man. Yes. And is he awake or not awake? He's, 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 he was just breathing and now he's stopped breathing. Is he awake or breathing. not awake? He's sleeping. And he is not breathing, you said? Yes. Not breathing at all? Yes. I have sent the help out there on the way while we're talking. Did you please. listen to Ma'am, help me out here. All right, and I, hurry I am, up, please. Ma'am, I need you to take a I breath. know. Stop it. I'm the only one here. Then stop talking and start listening so I can use you to help me. Okay. Right, I'm did listening. You, did you see I what happened? I have to happened? put you on speaker. <laughs> okay, so put that's just a little clip of it. After almost seven minutes, he finally got Sharon to cooperate and follow his instructions. The emergency help finally got there just under 11 minutes into the phone call, and they rang the doorbell. So the dispatcher told her to answer the door and come right back, but what she actually did was place him on hold, and much to his surprise, and after a little bit of silence, the call ended at about 11 and a half minutes. According to Sharon, when the paramedics got there, she told them that the last time she saw him responsive was about five hours earlier. Like I said, her timeline is seriously all over the place. So Simon was pronounced dead at 9.45 p.m. An investigator, Kelly Blanchard, got there just after midnight. After she took a look at the body, she questioned Sharon. Sharon told her her recollection of the events that night and also told her that Simon had heart problems and was scheduled for open-heart surgery. However, Simon's primary doctor, Dr. Krupp, said that Simon had recently been checked and had some scans done, and there was nothing wrong with his heart. After questioning Sharon, she took a look around the room. One of the things that caught her eye was a prescription bottle with the name Trevor Williams. It isn't unusual for celebrities to use an alias for prescriptions to try to keep their business private. However, Brittany and Simon would later be accused of getting multiple prescriptions filled at multiple pharmacies to get extra pills. Which is illegal, by the way. So, Officer Blanchard then noticed that one of the bedside drawers contained only items belonging to Sharon. Sharon immediately told her that this was her side of the bed and all the prescription bottles on top of the nightstand belonged to her. After this got out, it was all over the news that Sharon was sleeping with Simon. Nobody said whether it was sexual, but that's what was implied. Sharon denied the hell out of this. She was appalled, and she thought it was awful that people could accuse her of sleeping with Simon, who she saw as a son, supposedly. I was thinking about this, and I'm wondering if maybe there were a bunch of pill bottles that actually belonged to Brittany. Like, maybe Brittany really was addicted to the drugs, and they just hadn't been cleaned up yet. So maybe there were a bunch of Brittany's pills out in the open, and Sharon was just like, They're mine like in a panic moment to cover for Brittany. But apparently the name on the prescription bottles were Sharon Murphy and Sharon Monjack. That's pretty fucking weird, right? Simon's cause of death was also determined to be pneumonia and anemia. Interesting. I wonder if Simon also had heavy periods. <laughs> A few days later, Linda was able to recover Simon's phone from the house, and she found that he had recorded the conversation they had had where Sharon says, tell the doctor your temperature is 104. She thought it was super strange because he was barely coherent, barely able to function, and somehow he managed to record the conversation. So she got really creeped out, wondering if he was trying to send some kind of message from the dead, or if he knew he was going to die. On the topic of Simon's belongings, Sharon wouldn't let Linda take anything of her son's. There was a painting that Linda knew for sure belonged to Simon, but Sharon said that Simon was broke and had no money, and none of the stuff was his. Which is just weird, because Sharon had been acting this whole time like she adored Simon like her own son. 
Okay, so this seems like a good place to end part one. I didn't realize I was going to have this much research by the end of this, but here we are. Anyway, I'll be right back, literally right back with part two of Brittany Murphy, and that's where I'm going to talk about all the different theories surrounding Brittany's death. And I'm going to get down to the bottom of it. Before I go, don't forget that you can check out BrokenLimelight.com to read the transcript to any of my episodes whenever you want to review the details. Do me a favor, and if you enjoy this podcast, please tell your friends. Share my TikToks. I'm on TikTok now, guys. It's DDWestLV. Like me on Facebook. Comment on my episodes on YouTube. I appreciate your support so, so much. Okay, here I go. Stick around for part two.